Doctors have read it. What's the biggest case of faking it you've ever seen? Story one, taking trauma call during surgery residency, had a prisoner come in after a fight and claimed he couldn't move or feel his legs. All the CT scans and MRIs were normal, but we would shield his legs so he couldn't see them and poke them with needles and other sharp objects with enough force to cause pain. He never flinched or moved his legs at all. He was diagnosed with Siwara, spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality. He stayed in the hospital for a week, no improvement. Always had one guard with him. One night, they were down in the lobby watching some television, but the guard needed to use the restroom. The patient said, where could I possibly go? I'm paralyzed. Guard left him alone for two minutes. Patient last seen sprinting down the road, butt cheeks flapping in the breeze. Made it to a city four hours away by car before he was caught again. I've never seen anyone fake it so well. Truly playing the long con. Story two. Not a doctor, but worked in healthcare for nearly 20 hours. While taking a break from the ICU, due to it being emotionally draining, I worked in home health for a bit. I had a patient who clearly had Munchausen syndrome. On a daily basis, she would call her insurance to see what things would be covered if she was diagnosed with this or that. She called her doctor's office an average of 5X during my shift with her. She would report all kinds of non-real symptoms. She pestered the doctors into do exploitive laparoscopic surgery. Of course, nothing was found. One day I walked in and she was rubbing her incisions with rotten cabbage asterisk, trying asterisk to get it infected. She wasn't seeking pain meds, except to sell. Really, she was just as happy with antibiotics or stool softeners, anything, as long as they wrote her a prescription. And she got to go to the pharmacy where she did a whole song and dance for them too, claiming allergies and reactions. She always increased the exaggeration of her story too. One time she fluttered her eyes, after making sure I was looking, and said she lost consciousness in that half a second. She called the doctor and claimed she lost consciousness for five mins. She called the insurance and claimed it was 10 minutes. She called the pharmacy and claimed it was 30 min. Then she called 911 and told them she woke up on the floor after losing consciousness for four hours. The worst thing about her was she was a mom. Her son was 28 at the time, and by all the stories of his childhood illnesses and all her saying how he is severely disabled, I knew she basically messed up up his childhood with Munchausen by proxy. She portrayed him as being severely disabled, and that's why he would never find a wife. I met him. He was healthy and of average intelligence. He wasn't looking for a wife. He was boy, but she refused to accept that. Working with her was so miserable that I took a couple years off from any and all healthcare after that. Story three. Young, 18, 20 woman went running into small rural hospital ER pretending to have abdominal pain. Police officer had tagged her going 40 plus kilo on them over the limit, which was stunt driving. As per the new law in Ontario, impound and license suspension automatic. Cop followed her into ER and apparently said he'd be waiting for her when she left. Locum staff such as myself were housed at a small BB about 15 minutes away, and the ER had pre-printed order sets to be done before we arrived. When I arrived, she flat out admitted that she just came in because she freaked out and didn't stop. I told her we'd give her 45 minutes to call her parents, ah, family, before I booted her. Except BHCG came back positive, and subsequent ultrasound came back showing extremely early ectopic. Officer figures out something is up when he hears air ambulance call come in over radio. She was completely asymptomatic and just worked out that she dodged both charges and a life-threatening issue by accident. It was definitely a WTF moment. It get it. Well, this blew up overnight. I got a few messages. A little more info. Small rural hospitals in northern Ontario often service areas for more than an hour's drive away and still only have a catchment area of 2,000, 3,000 people. When on call, it was just that. We would do our days in the community clinic, then maybe hospital rounds, then go home and be on call. We wouldn't be at the hospital. There wasn't an on-call room where you would stay, for example. There were lots of times that you'd go a full night without being woken up, or maybe just a call from the acute care inpatient wing. Locums were short-term contracts for places that didn't have full-time medical staff for whatever reason. It's hard to attract clinicians if you don't even have broadband internet in the community. They generally pay very well. Story 4. Pediatric neuropsychologist. Got a referral for more or less consolidation care. Patient was 13, wheelchair-bound, required therapeutic oxygen, seizures, arthritis, musculoskeletal problems, suspected autism, completely nonverbal, severe behavior challenges, the list goes on. He was being followed by at least eight different specialties, clearly none of whom were communicating with each other. And MedList was tilde 18 prescriptions long, including some incredibly heavy-duty stuff. Opioids, antipsychotics, anti-epileptics, that sort of stuff. Got kicked to me after his umpteenth ER trip because the ER doc felt something was off and he needed someone to look at the whole picture. Factitious disorder by caregiver or Munchausen by proxy. All of the original symptoms were parent reported, going back to about a year old. It had possibly started with a febrile seizure, fever-induced seizure in infancy, but this was never witnessed by anyone but mom. She, it's unclear, she had been telling docs different things. 
She was convinced her son had all these disorders, told him he was going to pass away any day. He got a make-a-wish trip, donations, etc. He was removed from her custody and taken off most of his meds. Within a few weeks, he was out of the wheelchair playing basketball, no oxygen, super talkative and friendly, no behavior problems. He did have a pretty significant intellectual disability, but there's no way to say if that was organic or the result of the prescription cocktail he had been fed all his life. Hopefully, with some good therapy and a stable home, he can continue to make progress. Story 5. This patient comes in for back pain with weakness of the legs. Gets a full workup with MRI, standard blood work, and then some immunological things to look for stuff like myasthenia gravis. No neurological or immunological explanation for the weakness. Patient is seen by physical therapy, and they are of the opinion that the patient is holding back intentionally. Go to see the patient at the end of the day and prep them for discharge. Patient is infuriated that they're being discharged, yelling and screaming about how they aren't better, how they're disappointed in the institution, blah, blah, blah. They said one particular thing that still clearly stands out three, four years later. I can't believe you're sending me home already. I haven't even told my family I'm here. And now you're going to send me home before they even have the chance to see me, my attending. And I leave the room to arrange things with the nurses. We go back in and the patient is out of bed and standing up in the middle of the room. Miraculously, the patient is able to walk with zero assistance when they had so much difficulty with any assistance over the previous two days. At that point, they were enraged. Was enraged, we went into the room without knocking. They were discharged home after a conversation regarding abuse of medical services. Story 6. Nurse for an ophthalmologist here. Had a 21-year-old new patient claiming to be completely blind from a sudden and severe glaucoma diagnosis from a previous unknown doctor. Would feel around while walking, tried to keep eyes rolled back into his head. The whole nine yards. He said he is a famous YouTube rapper that is now unable to make videos or earn a living. I exclaimed to have heard of him before and very excitedly asked him to search and show me his YouTube channel on my phone so that I could subscribe. He took my phone out of my hand and effortlessly found the YouTube app and typed away in the search bar. Oh, and of course his eyes were back to normal and focused. Story 7? Was told this one by a fellow nurse I used to work with when we had a psych floor. It's not unusual for psych patients to stash things in various orifices. This one woman was convinced she was impregnated by a ghost-like figure, but no one would believe her. So one day she started complaining of massive pelvic and uterine pain. She called them contractions, so the doctor goes to do an exam. The doctor feels something larger in there, so they prep a table to get the object out, which was quite large. So the wonderful third year helping with the procedure starts hearing this woman complain of contractions and yelling things like, Should I push? I'm gonna start pushing! Doctor trying to work forceps around this woman's parts as to not hurt her. Finally goes, got. And as he starts saying it, he pulls out a baby doll. Head only. The poor med student did the wobble. Went all flush, had problems keeping balance, and about took a dive. I was told he didn't live that down the whole rotation. Story 8. Not a doctor, but I'm a UK-based midwife. Had a patient who had been in and out of hospital throughout her pregnancy with episodes of heavy bleeding. This was her sixth baby, so she was a fairly well-known patient in our unit. The issue was, no one had ever seen her actively bleeding. She'd call saying that she had bled down the toilet, but flushed it. And all the examinations we did came back completely normal, with mostly no evidence of any bleed whatsoever. On occasions during speculum examinations, we'd see the smallest amount of blood. I was caring for her during a shift where she yet again called to say she was bleeding, walked into her room, and found her jabbing around her vagina with a sharp object to make herself bleed. She had been doing it the entire pregnancy, the reason she gave. Because she had five noisy children at home, needed some rest, and knew we wouldn't admit her to hospital if it wasn't for a good reason. She would do it any time her being discharged home was mentioned. We ended up having to complete a perinatal mental health referral and consult with the safeguarding midwives as she was putting herself and baby at risk of serious harm. Edit. So this got a lot more attention than I ever expected. There's a lot of questions regarding birth control and questioning her parenting, so thought it best to add an edit. This patient was not by any means a benefit seeker. They were a hardworking and loving family that had full-time jobs. She had been booked in to have her tubes tied, but found out a week before the procedure that she was pregnant with this baby. She just couldn't cope during the pregnancy and became very intellectually unwell. She did not realize the implications or understand the face that she was causing massive harm to herself and her baby. She was referred to our perinatal mental health team and treated for psychosis. They also had a lot of input after she had her baby. She ended up having a C-section and was sterilized at the same time at her request. By all accounts, she's doing very well now. Also, thank you very much for the slivers, story nine. Obligatory, not a doctor. I'm a nurse. We had a guy who had to come in every three months to get a medical certificate to say he couldn't work at his retail job due to severe disabling back pain. He was receiving large amounts of insurance money for this condition. 
After the doctor had done his usual examination and questions and signed it off, the guy asks the doctor to check his shoulder, which Doc does, and asks how he injured it. Guy says playing rugby for a competitive team. Really says Doc, how long have you been playing for them? Guy has been playing and training the whole time. Doc puts this info on insurance form. Doc loses his cow in staff room laughing. Next week, the patient loses his cow in reception because his insurance has been canceled. Story 10. I'm a nurse, but not a doctor. I had a patient who worked in a hospital, janitor, so he knew enough to fake a bit. He was seeking pain meds, complaining of chest pain, wanting morphine. He was worked up for everything cardiac and was fine. Then he tried to claim GI discomfort when he was being discharged. Cleared again for everything. Fake chest pain again. Cleared again. Now he's my patient. I'm a new face. He's telling me he's having abdominal pain. I call the doctor, knowing this guy's history. He says he'll be up to see him soon. This patient wants a ginger ale, some stomach ache. I decide to go to lunch. My coworker comes into the lunchroom, disgusted. This guy had taken a dump in a basin and then dumped the ginger ale over it and tried to tell her he'd had fecal vomiting. He obviously needed Dilaudid right now for the pain. I walked into his room and sure enough, a pile of cow and a puddle of ginger ale. I told him I'd have to take away his food and drinks and we'd have to put an NG down. Suddenly he changed his tune. He admitted to faking it. Why do these people do what they do? In the story, opioids. Story 11. When I was a medical student, I worked in the pediatric side of the emergency room, and we would give popsicles to all the kids. One afternoon, an eight-year-old came in with his father, and I asked what was wrong. The kid couldn't remember what he complained about to his dad, and the dad couldn't remember why he brought his kid in. The kid's mom was a nurse. She was working at another hospital at the time, and she was the one that would keep track of these things. Anyway, after a few minutes trying to figure out what was going on, the kid asked, so, can I have my popsicle now? The kid was 100% healthy. Unfortunately, we reinforced bad behavior, and both the kid and the dad subsequently left with popsicles. Story 12. My cousin got glasses. Her seven-year-old little sister also wanted glasses because she thought it was so cool to wear them. So she started telling her teachers she couldn't read what was on the chalkboard, and she'd squint at home and go incredibly close to the TV to watch things because she said she couldn't see things clearly. Her parents got worried and took her to the doctor. She read everything wrong on the vision test. Everyone seemed convinced that she needed glasses. But the doctor was a little concerned because the tests indicated she needed really thick glasses. And usually that wasn't the case unless there was a family history of vision issues. Her parents both had 20-20th vision and her sister only had astigmatism. They all realized she was faking it. So the doctor told her parents in front of her that she'd need some pretty intense eye surgery so she'd be able to see without glasses. They even wheeled in a machine to make it convincing to say they could do the surgery right then and there. She freaked out, confessed to faking it all, and started to cry. She got grounded for a while. Story 13. Years ago, I had a patient who had been rear-ended in an auto accident a few weeks before I saw her. She had a history of lupus. She was decked out in the usual I'm crippled paraphernalia, crutches, neck brace, elbow braces, wrist braces, knee braces, and could barely walk. I saw her a couple of times, and she showed no improvement. One Saturday, I was on call but had to take a back streets route to the hospital because of an event taking place on the main thoroughfare. I apparently drove through her neighborhood because, wonders behold, there she was wearing old lady spandex power walking down the sidewalk, holding weights in both hands. I did not call out to her. Next week, she was back in clinic with her I'm crippled get up on again. Mm. A few weeks later, I got the subpoena for the deposition and it all became clear. Story 14, audiologist, hearing specialist, have worked in private sector with legal claims and with the VA, handling veterans' claims of hearing loss. With those two populations, having people faking hearing loss is pretty common. Now, as a professional, for me, the hearing test starts when I call the person's name from the waiting room. In a normal voice, I call them. If they answer, I already know that they're normal, no worse than mild loss. This was the case with this guy. He answered and came in. We had a normal conversation. So case history over, time to test. I give the instructions over the headphones at a reasonable 50 decibels, dB. Raise you hand when you hear the tone. 50 dB tone should be easy and clear, but he doesn't raise his hand. I go up and up and up. Finally, I'm putting a 100 dB tone in his ear. He's flinching from pain, it's so loud. But he doesn't raise his hand to indicate he's heard the tone, even with re-instruction. I immediately know what I'm dealing with. I have taught entire classes on how to spot and try to get estimated true results from people trying to fake it. Long story short, I wrote a damning report outlining all his inconsistencies and faking behaviors. The thing that made this one so memorable is that we had such a pleasant conversation before. He was a fire chief. I have firefighters in my family. It was one of those where you think, if it wasn't for professional, patient, appropriate distance, we could hang and be friends. But then, this guy was determined to get a disability rating. And it just pissed me off. I have other stories in case anyone is interested, but it's likely this comment gets buried. Story 15, fourth year medical student. On my ER rotation, and a trauma came in from a woman that, that had been arrested. 
During the drive, the patient banged her head four times against the window of the police car and then went unresponsive. She came to us with a bruise over her forehead and unresponsive. We all smelled BS, but the patient was a great actor. Didn't even flinch during the digital rectal exam, which is standard for all patients that come in through the trauma bay. Though some of the nurses said that they caught her peeking at us when we'd leave the room. We ended up getting a CT scan, which was normal, and was even considering intubating her to secure her airway when our attending finally walked over to her, opened her eyelids and held them open while telling her to wake up. Finally, she started fighting to close her eyes and the jig was up. The doctor called her out and she proceeded to start screaming at us. She was much more pleasant when she was pretending to have a brain injury. Story 16. I had a patient when I worked in an ICU that was sedated and on a vent. A family member showed up out of nowhere and was staying day and night. I got pretty suspicious of them because they were clearly lying about knowing this person. Just talked to the fake family member about how it must have been sad since they just celebrated their birthday a week or so before getting ill. This person said it was a wonderful party and such, to which I replied their birthday hadn't occurred yet and wouldn't for months. Turned out when security came, it was a homeless person who snuck in and found a room with a sedated patient and decided to make it a place to stay. Needless to say, security to enter the ICU was absolute cow. Story 17. Posted this before, but male patient, 18 years old, rolled in unconscious. Mom says he's been like that for the past four hours. Go to check his lungs when I hear something interesting. I place the stethoscope near his mouth and hear him breathe in normally, but then breathe out by saying breathe. No joke. Male patient, 21 years old, admitted with inability to speak for last two hours and respiratory distress. Lungs clear, but we hook him up to oxygen for a few minutes. After he's taken off, his father comes running and drags me over, saying his son's tongue refuses to go back in after receiving the oxygen. I look at the kid and he's seriously just lying there with his tongue poking out like a child. I tell them to push it back in. A few hours later, the dad tells me the boy is convulsing. I go to see without making my presence known and he's lying there just fine. The moment I ask the mom how he's doing, he starts convulsing. Think of an odd version of the worm, but on his back. Female patient, 16 years old, admitted with complaints of recurrent seizures and frothing from the mouth. I look at her and she is literally blowing spit bubbles. I check her reflexes. Everything is intact. The moment I turn away to check on another patient, she suddenly becomes rigid and the spitting intensifies. Male patient, 30 years old, unconscious and completely unresponsive for six hours. This guy was totally dedicated to his act. I initially approached it as a stroke, but when the blood pressure, ECG, reflexes, pupils, etc. all are normal, I start checking pain sensation. He slowly began to open his eyes and groan as I asked him to tell me his name. But the moment his Achilles tendon was pressed, he suddenly sat up stated his name, and declared himself cured. Female patient, 17 years old, complained of respiratory distress and convulsions. Everything's normal on admission, and she's conscious but refuses to eat. Parents are worried out of their minds, and every few minutes she has a fit where she would just basically shake from side to side. She let slip to a nurse that she didn't want to go to school that week, so she was faking an illness. Since she was refusing to eat, the attending wrote up an order for a nasogastric tube, which was inserted and then removed by her in a matter of minutes. Story 18. My EMT instructor told me he and his crew ran on a seizure call. Gets there. Doors wide open. Female patient is unconscious in Buck Peach. They start assessing her while one guy clears the house to make sure no one else is inside and get something to cover her. After doing an arm drop test and trying to check her pupils, they all figure out that she's faking her illness. However, their general policy was never to openly state that, but to just roll with it instead. In line with that, he starts to call for an ambulance to come take her to the hospital. When one of his guys says, Captain, she's clearly faking it. Then this woman, who is supposed to be unconscious and unresponsive, says, No, I'm not. Story 19. ER patient registers with chief complaint of dental pain, allergies to every known NSAID. Yes, I know this can actually be genuine, such as with ARD. This is a small rural hospital, so I happen to see this guy go across the hall to the lounge and help himself to a big mug of hot black hospital-quality coffee and proceed to drink it in the waiting area. On asking about the dental pain, he reports that the pain is severe and worsened by drinking cold or hot liquids. His head and neck exam is non-acute, and he is discharged to home with instructions for supportive care, including ice packs, and follow-up with his dentist ASAP. His dissatisfaction is loud and salty. Story 20. When I was a kid, I would plan my sick days way ahead of time. Had an old thermos that I would pour leftover milk, meat, whatever. Leave it on the windowsill in my bedroom, just letting it fester for a month. Of course, the thermos was closed, so no smells escaped. I set an alarm for the middle of the night, dumped the contents of the thermos on my rug, and ran in to tell my dad I was throwing up and so sick. However, this thermos monstrosity filled the entire condo up with horrible smells, and both me and my dad ended up puking into the tub at the same time every time we tried to clean up the rug. He had to take the day off work, too. 
Needless to say, I never pulled that again. Story 21. Obligatory, not a doctor. I was an EMT and had a frequent flyer who rotated through various chief complaints, one which was complete blindness. Emphasis on complete. We did our duty, of course. Got him on board, took vitals, BLS'd him to the nearest hospital. But we occasionally had a bit of fun with him. One of the blindness calls. We noted that he walked a rather narrow and windy path from his trailer to the rig without any issue. Once on board the rig, when asked for his insurance card, he fingered through his wallet and fetched it from among a mass of cards without issue. When asked direct questions, he met our gaze and followed it when our heads moved. When I pointed all this out to him, his only response was to quickly look at something over my shoulder and stammer through, no, I'm blind. Okay, our mistake then. Off we go. Story 22. I'm an EM doc. Lots of weak pseudo-seizure stories, ITT. Those are fairly common. Some of those people are straight up seeking IV, but most are people with seizure disorders who have some psych issues and are coming by it honestly. They're just sad, confused people who don't know how to handle stress for the most part. I've seen all sorts of weird people faking symptoms. The most devious was a guy I'll call Steve. Steve had to be in the medical field somehow. Probably a nurse or tech. He was fairly tall and skinny. He claimed to have Marfan syndrome, a rare connective tissue disease that makes you tall and skinny and puts you at a higher risk for an aortic dissection. You can think of aortic dissections as the main pipe carrying blood starting to break. They're bad. Steve didn't only claim to have Marfans. He stated that he had a dissection in the past and it was done by Dr. BFD at BFD Medical Center. Real surgeon and real institution. I'm removing the name. He then would come in with a classic story for dissection. He'd say he had a tearing chest pain radiating to the back. Steve took it to the next level. He'd flex his arm when the blood pressure cuff was on one arm, then relax on the other. This caused vastly different blood pressure readings in each arm. And this is another classically taught finding in dissection. In addition to this, the illegitimate child would say that he had an anaphylactic reaction to contrast dye. He did this in an attempt to force us to pretreat him with Benadryl and steroids, which took eight hours. During those eight hours, he'd request opiates after opiates before getting his CTA done. He also would get nauseated requesting Phenergan. For those who don't know, IV Dilaudid, Phenergan, and Benadryl is the best ride the hospital can really put you on. They all potentiate each other. Highly reviewed by opiate junkies everywhere. I got Steve on his third visit. The two prior visits showed no dissections. Steve was dumb enough to come in during normal business hours, and I managed to get a hold of this surgeon. Surgeon said he'd never taken care of the guy, and that he'd gotten multiple calls about him. I still offered the CTA to the patient. I told him he'd be getting zero opiates, though. He left in a fit. Fudge Steve. No one has seen him since. I'm sure he's out of some new hospital now. Story 23. I'm a nurse. I work in acute rehab, so patients come to us to do physical therapy and recover from surgeries, illnesses, etc. Had a patient who played us good. So this dude was ready to go home and medically stable, but very, very anxious. He would always ask for me to recheck his vitals and blood sugar. Always come up with new concerns like his hand is twitching, or he feels dizzy, or he's having blurry vision. I thought I was pretty good at ruling out his concerns and calming him down. Then one day I check his vitals and his pulse is quite low, like 48. Everything else is good, so I'm not concerned. I tell him I'll recheck in a few minutes. I come back and he's looking not so good. Pulse still low, oxygen quite low, and he's just woozy and slow to respond. I get my charge nurse in and we're worried about an opiate overdose. We discuss this and the patient's breathing gets slower and shallower. Call the MD, give him some Narcan, call EMS. They arrive and now he's nearly unresponsive, barely reacts to the sternal rub. They give him more Narcan with no effect, so now we're thinking rule out stroke. He has the slightest droop on one side of his mouth. Was that always there? Oh no, did I miss it? I give them a report and they rush him to the hospital, where they do a very thorough workup because he's high risk for a lot of issues. We followed up the next day and nothing was wrong with him. The bad person must have heard me mention his pulse and said, This is my chance! I think he held his breath when I took his O2 sat and started dropping his mouth once we mentioned stroke. Probably skipped lunch since his blood sugar was low too. All because he didn't want to go home? Now he's banned from our facility. Story 24. Patient and a family member coming in stating that patient has epilepsy and needs. While gathering basic history, the patient starts having a seizure. Rolling on the ground, head shaking and feet kicking... I asked the patient if he needed any help during the seizure. He responds back, saying he is experiencing a seizure. Family member is obviously trying to convince me that patient is having seizures like this every day and needs. I kindly told patient and family member this is psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, and he needs to see a psychologist for an evaluation. They had a hard time believing this condition and walked out. Story 25. Had a woman bring in a kidney stone she passed and said she was in agony with another stone. She ramped up the analgesic ladder until she was on opiates, pethidine most likely. All he scans came back negative and we had the stone she brought in analyzed. It came back as being quartz, not a mineral that occurs in the body. When confronted with this fact, she quickly left. Six months later and I'd rotated to another nearby hospital. 
A woman came in with abdominal pain, and I went to see her. We locked eyes and instantly recognized each other's. I said nothing, but she knew the jig was up and self-discharged. Story 26. I'm an ICU and ER nurse. We get a lot of malingering in the ER. One day, one of our frequent flyers came in and started faking a seizure in triage. Now, obviously, I know this lady, and she's fake seized a million times before. But this time, it's in the lobby in front of about 30 people who have no way of knowing that it's fake. She's lolling around on the floor, making a oh, no fool of herself, and folks look horrified. I walked up to her and said calmly, Karen, what are you doing? To which this genius responds, I'm seizing. I told her to stop seizing. So she did. Edit, no, her name wasn't actually Karen. I just did that for confidentiality. Story 27. Late to the thread, so this will probably get buried, but I'm a resident, not a psych resident. But this happened in my psychiatry rotation in medical school when I was in medical school. There was a patient at an inpatient psychiatric facility for to the sky ideation. She constantly insisted that she had a mass on her breasts and demanded to be physically examined only by male doctors. When the psychiatrist I was rotating under declined to perform a physical exam, she asked me to do it during my daily patient interview. I also declined physical exam, but had a bit of a hunch to check her medical records. It turned out she had an ultrasound done a week before that found only normal ball tissue without masses. However, apparently this this lady had frequented many doctor's offices with various complaints of an unspecific nature and would usually focus on breasts or vaginal complaints when she visited male physician's offices. We diagnosed her with factitious disorder, formerly known as Munchausen syndrome, and histrionic personality disorder. It seems her goal was mostly attention from medical professionals. She had lots of issues, but we also had to be careful to make sure she wasn't fishing for a lawsuit. Patients like her are why doctors document everything meticulously, so the patient wouldn't admit to making things up all the time. According to the psychiatrist I was working with, she didn't actually believe any of her health problems exist, and her primary goal was the attention from medical professionals. If she actually believed she was sick, we would have diagnosed her with illness anxiety disorder, commonly known as hypochondria. Story 28. Dentist here had a patient complain of toothache, which required extraction. Did extraction and patient left in good health. Patient called within 20 minutes of leaving, saying they were in the worst pain of their life. 11 tenths pain and requested a script for oxycodone. Patient came back the next day in tears, shambles. I start to feel bad because it looked like they were in genuine pain. Take a look in the mouth and everything is fine. Healing is normal. And once again, they request oxycodone. I say, no, we need to think of something else. And that is where it changed. When I declined giving a strong narcotic, they flipped the switch and became violent. Yelling, throwing instruments, had to be escorted out. This is where I learned candy seekers will do anything to obtain what they want. Story 29. I'm not a doctor, but a nurse. There was a geriatric patient taking advantage of the call bell because she was an attention seeker. She always needed really basic things to get done for her because she thought the place was a hotel. It was a rehabilitation ward, and we should try to motivate patients to do as much for themselves as possible. She would ring the bell for reasons like, please lift the blanket up for me, or please pass me my phone, or please feed me, and claimed that her hands didn't work. I caught her several times, lifting herself off the bed with her hands, grabbing her phone when it rang. You get the gist. After days of saying no, and that she needs to start doing things for herself, she grew more and more frustrated. Eventually, she snapped, grabbed me by my collar, shook me aggressively, and yelled, why don't you understand about the fact that my hands don't work? I didn't know what to tell her. I just looked at her and blinked as she slowly released her death grip off me. I guess I healed her hands. Praise the Lord. One up vote. Equal sign one prayer for an old lady's arthritis. Story 30. When I was in prison, there was a guy who wanted to go to medical range because it isn't as strict as a regular range. He told the doctors he felt like he was having a heart attack. They called for a medical emergency and people came rushing into the range and we got locked down. He pretended to fall on the ground and the prison's doctor came strolling in, not hurried at all. When he came in, he came over to the guy laying on the ground and put his fingers on his neck and said, I can't feel a pulse. The guards looked scared and the doctor opened his bag and took his clipboard out and started tapping on it and making other noises and yelled out, I'm going to shock him. The guy immediately sat up and started to fake gasp. I think he was holding his breath. And then the doctor was like, idiot, put him in segregation on suicide watch and make sure he's being checked on in quarters. Just to be clear. Suicide watch sucks. You get absolutely nothing in your cell but a dress made out of rip-resistant fabric. He was there for two weeks and didn't try any cow like that again. Story 31. I'm a doctor. I used to tell stories about things like this, but lately I've come to realize that many people who are faking it have a severe psychologic trauma. For example, child-close relationship abuse, which is manifesting in physical symptoms or some other bad cause for their factitious disorder. 
Even for the malingerers, too, they're usually in a terrible place in life, despite how much fun it is to read about their stories. We should treat both types of people with compassion and understand the circumstances that brought them to that place in life. I totally had a patient who nearly terminated herself injecting her own poop into her skin, though. That was pretty wild. Story 32. Anybody ever had a case of this person is probably just faking it for opiates that turned into a real case when the patient refused opiates? I overheard something to this effect when I was waiting to give a ride to a coworker. The patient was complaining of severe lower back pain, and apparently his x-rays were clear. The nurse was telling him as much, but he kept asking her what other tests they could run, and if they could do anything for the pain. He explains that none of the OTC stuff he tried was working. Red flag. Nurse flat out tells him that they don't prescribe oxycodone or similar without a clear diagnosis, but unexpectedly, the guy doesn't throw a fit. Says something to the effect, I understand why not. I wouldn't touch that stuff myself. Is there a surgery or something you can do to deaden the nerve, though? Or like zap it? It's terminating me. This prompts a sudden review. Blood work strongly suggests kidney stones or cysts, and last I heard they were going to take him for ultrasound. The nurse's attitude changed so fast when he begged for surgery over meds, you could hear it in her voice. She was a million times more sympathetic helping him roll over to get ready for the ultrasound than telling him his x-rays were clear. Story 33. Source? I'm a practicing hospitalist physician. Simulate is real. It's most commonly seen in the ED where folks want pain meds or in the setting of underlying psychiatric disease. However, the interesting and not well-known feature of faking it is that it's a diagnosis just like any other condition or behavior. It has typical features, and if these features are violated, you want to be careful that you aren't misattributing the behavior. The most common incorrect diagnosis of faking it that I see as a hospitalist is psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. People will come in with debilitating loss of function that doesn't have the normal appearance of a seizure, will have a negative EEG, and will get told that they're faking it. In actuality, these folks have a poorly understood temporary loss of function that's every bit as real to them as epilepsy. It just isn't epileptic in origin. Establishing the diagnosis and having a conversation with the patient about the non-existent risk to them in these events is often curative by itself. You have to be really careful when deciding that someone is faking it. In my world, at least, it's often incorrect. Story 34. When I was at boot camp in the military, I am in Europe, we were having a one-week survival drill outdoors in the winter time. This was in the Arctic, so you knew it was going to suck. A buddy and me decided to report in sick with fever and went to the infirmary. Young civilian nurses did the triaging. One by one, we were sent to a room with an old-school thermometer covered in plastic and lube and asked to insert it in the backside. She left the room giving us a few minutes to insert it ourselves. That gave us a minute to take the thermometer out of the plastic sleeve, warm it on a light bulb, and then, desperately shaking it when it spiked beyond human temperature, getting it down to a reasonable fever temperature and put the sleeve back on before the nurse returned and we had proof we had a fever. We both did it and it worked. We had a few great days in the sick bay getting pampered by nurses, Joking around and flirting with the nurses as awkward as 18-year-olds does. Every morning, the doctor made his rounds, so we repeated the thermometer routine and blew hot air into the pillow to warm up our foreheads so they were warm and sweaty until Thursday morning. The nurse came in, gave us the thermometer as usual, and said the doctor would be visit in a few minutes. On her way out the door, she smiled and added, And by the way, guys, if you still have a fever, you will not be released until Monday because the doctor has the day off on Friday and there are no doctors here on weekends. We were miraculously fever-free and healthy again and were dismissed that morning in time for the weekend leave. Thinking back on this, we were young and just wanted a few days away from the monotonous training and cold. And I still sometimes send a warm thought to that nurse who obviously knew we were faking it, but played along. Story 35. Front desk person. Had a young male patient who was compelled to give a urine sample. He couldn't go, which is fine, though somewhat unusual for a young guy. Whatever. Here's some water. Have a seat. We've got all day. He had some iced tea in a bottle that he was slowly drinking. Whatever. Input equals sign output. After about 45 minutes, he goes to give a sample. Great. Cups are in the washroom. Please wash your hands, etc. He comes back out with a sample that looks like absolutely normal, clear yellow urine. So I take it from him to bundle with the recu and send off. It's cold. He'd cheeked some of the iced tea and spit it into the sample container and diluted it to urine color with asterisk, asterisk, cold, asterisk, asterisk water. Here's a fun healthcare tip from me to you. Freezing cold urine is a sign of about one thing, and it ain't good. I don't remember what it was we were looking for, but it wasn't sweets of abuse. Probably just protein glucose for a truck driving license. I don't think we dipped it just for cows and giggles, but I'm sure it would have had a massive glucose reading, thus eradicating the whole point of trying to fake it asterisk anyway. Asterisk, story 36. So I'm not a doctor, but during my sophomore year in high school, a freshman came in with a blue sock wrapped around her foot, calling it her cast. 
She walked around on crutches but didn't actually lean on them for support. Walking completely normally but moving her crutches forward and backward like a little kid exaggerates swinging his arms back and forth while running. Obviously fake. Which pissed the hell out of a few kids at my school that actually needed crutches. When one of them went up to her and tried to tell her what she was doing was wrong, she screamed, Stop mocking my disability! and threatened to report them to the school guidance department. Quite the attention seeker. Story 37. Not a doctor, but I've 25M got a story. I was raised in the Cook Islands, which is a very Christian island and set in the old ways. One of my friends, 25M, used to come over to my place to study. I was a naughty kid growing up, and one Saturday night he came over, and we drank a whole bottle of Bombay Sapphire. We were 14. On the Sunday, his mom came over to pick him up for the morning church service. On Monday, he didn't show up to school. Three days went by a week. Two weeks. After two weeks of his absence, I called him, and he told me the funniest story. When he went to church the day he left, he said he had to throw up, so he ran out of the church to a tree and threw up. His mom saw and threw him in the car and took him to the hospital. Sidebar. His family was the type to disown a family member for having close relationship before marriage. Back to the story, he gets to the hospital and throws a fit because he doesn't want his blood tested. The doctor just diagnoses him based off of his symptoms and says he has the flu. Gets sent home and is feeling ill for a week straight. After that, his parents are convinced he doesn't have the flu, but he instead has dengue fever, which was going around the island at the time. He refused treatment and stayed home pretending to be sick the entire time. After two weeks, he was able to return to school. It's been 11 years and we still talk. His family still thinks he had dengue fever to this day, when in reality he was hungover and probably got alcohol poisoning from our Saturday night bender. He still won't tell his mom. Story 38. I'm an ER doc in a very busy public level eye trauma center. We deal with very, very sick people, but also a huge amount of don't need to be theirs. Our wait times for real rooms in the back can get truly atrocious. It's sometimes hard to not get frustrated with people, especially when they are actively faking it. One lady came in and had been waiting maybe 30 minutes. Original complaint, flu-like symptoms for six hours in a 28-year-old. Triage nursing came rushing back with her seizing in a wheelchair. I get to her and she starts yelling, seizure. Ah, oh, I'm having a say, 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 zure. Even without the obvious, we can usually tell pretty easily, but we can't. For a lot of reasons, including both other patient comfort and general optics, have people in the lobby screaming and drooling and urinating. I ask her to stop, and for a moment she looks at me upset that I would even think to tell her to stop. She resumes. Everyone left the room for her to calm down, and she was discharged after history. An exam didn't require further workup or treatment. She did demand new pants because she urinated during her episode. She was for some reason happy with that outcome. She jumped ahead of a new kidney failure, a high-risk chest pain, and what turned out to be appendicitis. The key is not getting jaded by it. And aside, non-poleptus seizures, focal seizures, etc. do exist. We can tell the difference with pretty high reliability. Story 39. Anybody who has worked in an ER can tell you stories of malingering, candy-seeking, pseudo-seizures, Munchausen syndrome, and by proxy. The worst cases that come to mind for me was a Munchausen by proxy and a Munchausen. The by proxy was a mom who brought her toddlers, two of them, in stating they were vomiting blood. They were transferred to a pediatric ward even though they seemed fine. That mother was known to us as being psychiatrically unstable. I list this as a worst because those poor kids barely have a chance at a normal life. The other was a Munchausen who was exposed after numerous episodes of septic shock requiring pressors. She was missing digits because of prior levofed infusion. I am being intentionally vague re which limb etc because hippe asterisk edit originally misspelled HIPAA. We unmasked her true disease when, for the fifth time in three months, she suddenly became severely hypotensive, like 50 to 60 systolic lethargic then unresponsive, about an hour into her ER evaluation. Something was fishy, since intake vitals and exam were not too bad. Started a Narcan drip and boom, BP normalizes. Even though candy screen was normal, we figured she was dosing herself with fentanyl, street, after intake in the ER. From that point, she tried this trick several times, each time fixed with a Narcan drip. Called surrounding hospitals, all of which had treated her recently to let them know. Story 40. Not a doctor myself, but on the flip side of this, my doctor basically told me I was making up my problem. I told him I was having severe sciatic pain, numbness, weakness in the leg. He did some tests on me to check my muscular responses, as well as movements that cause pain, etc., and sent me for an x-ray, which makes no sense because even I knew it was nerve muscle related and essentially said something along the lines of, you're making it out to be worse than it really is inside your own head, which is making your body believe it. He told me to give it time and it would go away. After nearly three months of repeated visits, failed physiotherapy, medications, chiropractic visits, he very reluctantly booked an appointment for me to see an orthopedic surgeon, insisting that I'd be wasting his time. 
After five mines talking to the surgeon, he booked me for back surgery to fix a bulging disc that was pinching my sciatic nerve up against a bony growth on one of my vertebrae. I don't see that doctor anymore. Story 41. I had a doctor turn me away as a candy seeker, but that, uh, wasn't exactly the case. I got turned away as a candy seeker from an urgent care doctor who said I was just an idiot wearing bad shoes. She cited wearing Tevas, which I wore because I couldn't bear the compression of putting my foot into a shoe anymore, to the clinic as evidence of this. All of this was with my father in the room. I couldn't cite any trauma to the foot, and she said it was swollen, but not enough to be broken, which I agreed with, which is why the whole thing was confusing. She ordered x-rays, confirmed it wasn't broken, yelled at me. I told her I wasn't even asking for sweets. I just wanted to know what was wrong with me. This seemed to agitate her more, then kicked me out. A few years later, because the foot has been bothering me ever since, I go to a doc, and they take x-rays. Apparently, the old x-ray from that urgent care clinic was within the same network so that the radiologist who examined the new x-ray compared it with the old one. I got a letter saying it showed a redemonstration of degradation of the navicular cuneiform joint. Degradation of the joint, redemonstration. I got turned away for a candy seeker at 26 years old by a doctor who totally missed that I had arthritis. Story 42. I was working as a medical examiner and walked through the ER to go to lunch with my mate who worked there was a bloke there who said he had seizures and he needed painkillers or muscle relaxers or anything. Nurse asks him what happens when he has seizures and he stands up, falls to floor and begins to act like he's in the exorcist. Was hilarious at first, then my mate said they do that to get any kind of meds. Was sad though. He also asked if I could help him and I said all my patients have a zero survival rate and I often find their limbs after an accident. He did not want my help anymore. Hell, I do amazing stitch work.